vaccination exemptions, everyone's talking about them. And as a general practitioner working over here in Australia, I often get asked, hey doc, what are the criteria for a vaccine exemption? And so in today's episode of Dr. Nora, we go through the official criteria for obtaining a vaccination exemption. And so we're gonna go through this two page document, so it's not too long. We're gonna take a look at what are the criteria for a temporary exemption. Now, it is important to know that these temporary exemption measures can only be performed by a medical practitioner practicing in Australia. As a background, it says that COVID-19 vaccinations have been demonstrated to be safe and effective, and as such are recommended for all Australians from 12 years and over. There are a few situations where the vaccine is contraindicated, which means that it's not given. So contraindicated means that it's not safe to give this person. So first up, let's take a look at the first criteria for a temporary exemption. I'm gonna read this verbatim because it's really easy to understand. Valid reasons for a temporary exemption include for an mRNA COVID-19 vaccination, inflammatory cardiac illness within the past three months, for example, myocarditis or pericarditis. Now you may have heard of these recently, which can be associated in younger adolescent boys related to the vaccination. Now, now this is a very rare adverse effect, but it is something that can be provided with a temporary exemption. Other reasons include acute rheumatic fever or acute rheumatic disease, i.e. with active myocardial inflammation. And myocardial means the heart, so heart inflammation or acute decompensated heart failure. So in this situation, if you are suffering from one of these conditions, you would be eligible for a temporary vaccination for the mRNA brands of COVID vaccines. So that includes Moderna and Pfizer. So for all of the other COVID vaccinations, here are the other temporary exemption criteria. First one is acute major medical condition e.g. undergoing a major surgery or hospital admission for a serious illness. Now this has to be assessed by your medical doctor or your specialist within the hospital. And it could be a situation where your specialist has advised you that it is not in your best interest to have the vaccination at this time, but rather to focus on the major surgery that you may be experiencing. And typically these are time limited conditions, i.e. you're gonna have them for a period of time and after which period of time you can then have the vaccination safely. The second point is PCR confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection, where vaccination can be referred until six months after the infection. So that means that if you've been tested to be positive for COVID through a PCR swab, you can have the vaccination deferred until six months after the infection. Vaccination should be deferred for 90 days in people who have received monoclonal antibody or convalescent plasma therapy, which are typically administered in the hospital. So if you have been to hospital and you've been admitted and you've received some sort of treatment such as monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma therapy, then your vaccination can be deferred for 90 days. Next up, any serious adverse event attributed to a previous dose of a COVID-19 vaccine without any other cause identified and with no acceptable alternative vaccine available. For example, a person aged under 60 years of age who is contraindicated to receive Pfizer and in whom the risks do not outweigh the benefits for the receipt of the AstraZeneca vaccine is eligible for a temporary exemption. So let's just go through that again. So for example, if you are not able to take the Pfizer vaccine because of one reason or another, it's not been indicated in yourself, perhaps you've had an anaphylactic reaction to the vaccine and because of your age, you're unable to take another form of the vaccination, you are also deemed as being eligible for a temporary exemption to the vaccination. Next up, if the vaccine is a risk to themselves or others during the vaccination process, they may warrant a temporary vaccine exemption. This may include a range of individuals with underlying developmental or mental health problems, but noting that non-pharmacological interventions can safely facilitate vaccination in many individuals with behavioral disturbances and that specialist services may be available to facilitate the safe administration of vaccines in this population. So to read that again, that means that if the person who's receiving the vaccine has got, is, a, is at a risk to themselves or others whilst they're having the vaccination, they may warrant a temporary exemption. However, in such patients who might have a developmental issue or a mental health issue, if there are non-pharmacological interventions that can safely facilitate the vaccination, then that usually tends to allow them to have the vaccine. And typically these patients will need a specialist service to aid the facilitation of this vaccination. So those were the official criteria as to why you can have a temporary exemption. Now, temporary exemptions, as I said earlier, can only be administered by a medical professional or perhaps even a specialist. So it might be that your doctor, your general practitioner, has referred you to another specialist to have a look, for example, at your heart, for example, a cardiologist, who may then do those assessments and see if you do have myocarditis or pericarditis, and then they then can provide you with your temporary exemption. 
or it may be that your general practitioner may refer you to a psychiatrist who can then assess your mental health and see whether or not you are eligible to have a temporary exemption. Of course, these are all things that need to be looked at very carefully and according to the current criteria. Now let's take a look at the duration of the temporary exemptions. So temporary exemptions for longer than six months are not recommended in the first instance, as they should be reviewed as the individual recovers from their acute major medical illness. So that means that if you have been referred to a cardiologist and you have been diagnosed with pericarditis or myocarditis, you will be reviewed sequentially to see if you have recovered from the disease or the illness and whether or not you should still be having a temporary exemption or whether it's now safe enough for you to have the vaccination and therefore protect you from COVID-19 infection. Okay, so that sums up the temporary exemption criteria as per the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisations. Now let's take a look at the other document that I have in front of me, which is directly from the Australian Government Department of Health, which looks at contraindications, i.e. situations where we definitely should not provide a person with a vaccination. So the contraindications or reasons for us not to provide a person with a Pfizer or a Moderna vaccination, i.e. a mRNA vaccination, are as follows. So, a contraindication to one of the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines should be considered a contraindication to the other COVID-19 vaccines made with that vaccine platform. For example, a person who is contraindicated for Pfizer would also be contraindicated for Moderna. So here are the reasons why you can't have an mRNA vaccination. The first one is anaphylaxis to a previous dose of an mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, for example, Pfizer or Moderna. What does anaphylaxis mean? Well, anaphylaxis, you may hear of people who've got a peanut allergy or even allergies to certain compounds in, in food or, or even um, cosmetic products. What happens when we have anaphylaxis is our body swells up. It has a huge histamine response. Generally people, this is a really serious and life-threatening condition. And generally people who suffer from anaphylaxis will have facial swelling, tongue swelling, and they won't be able to breathe. And this becomes an acute medical emergency. These people need to be triaged hospital ASAP, have medication to help to reduce the swelling down and to help them to breathe again. So for anybody who has had an anaphylactic reaction, whereby their facials, their face has swollen up, their tongue is swollen up, they're unable to breathe, they've had to go to hospital to receive treatment for this, they are contraindicated or they're not allowed to have a further dose of an mRNA vaccination if the reaction has happened after their first mRNA vaccination. The second point is anaphylaxis to any component of the vaccine, including polyethylene glycol, otherwise known as PEG. Now, this is generally something that I see a lot of in general practice. And a lot of people say to me, well, doctor, how do I know I'm allergic to PEG? Or how do I know I've taken it safely? Or, you know, how do I know what it is? Well, just to break this down a little bit more, PEG, or otherwise known as a macrogol, is a common chemical compound, which is found in a lot of cosmetic products. It's also found in um, laxatives or medicines for constipation. It's also found in a number of tablets as well. And it's even found in hand sanitizer as well. And so if patients who are particularly worried or concerned that they may have a reaction to PEG, may have had some issues with certain hand sanitizers or perhaps laxatives. Um, and generally speaking, those patients we would refer on to an immunologist, which is a doctor who specializes in the immune system, who can do some testing to see if they have got a true anaphylactic reaction to PEG. So if you think this is an issue for yourself, it might be worthwhile speaking to your medical doctor because they can then arrange for you to speak to a specialist to decide if you need to have any further testing for PEG. And what it does go to say on the next page of this documentation is that it says anaphylaxis to PEG is reported to be extremely rare. That is 37 case reports between 1977 and 2016. So you can see that there is a very small chance that you would have an anaphylactic reaction to this, but it is always really important for you to double check this with your medical practitioner. And the third criteria whereby you may not receive the mRNA vaccination is any other serious adverse event attributed to a previous dose of Pfizer or Moderna and without another cause identified, that has been reported to state adverse event reporting programs and or the TGA, and has been determined following review by and or on the opinion of an experienced immunization provider slash medical specialist to be contraindicated, taking into the account whether repeat vaccination doses would be associated with a risk of recurrent or serious adverse event. So it is important to know that if you did have a serious adverse event, that these are to be taken very seriously. And sometimes if this does happen to yourself, then you'll be referred on for a specialist to have a look and to decide whether or not this is truly gonna to happen to you again. Let's take a look at the vaccine adverse events that are considered to be serious. 
Assessment of adverse events following immunization requires detailed information about the event and the severity of the condition, as well as the termination of the likelihood of a causal link with vaccination. Serious adverse events are generally defined as those which require hospitalization, for example, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia following the first dose of AstraZeneca. Now this means blood clots with low platelet counts following the first dose of AstraZeneca. Secondly, those events that are medically significant, for example, immunothrombocytopenia purpura or myocarditis. Thirdly, events which are potentially life-threatening, for example, anaphylaxis, and or result in a persistent or significant disability, for example, Guillain-Barr syndrome, which is a disorder that occurs in the nerves. These reactions do not typically include expected local or systemic reactions that are known to occur within the first few days of vaccination. So these are conditions whereby you may get a bit of arm pain or a little bit of fever. This is not included in this criteria. Attributing a serious adverse event to a previous dose of a COVID-19 vaccine may require discussion with the person's GP, local immunization service or relevant medical specialist. So generally speaking, the patients who may have these serious adverse events will generally be hospitalized. This will be a very significant condition that would have happened. And for them to now be exemplified or to have them not no longer have those vaccinations, it usually takes a discussion with the multidisciplinary team, for example, from the general practitioner to the specialist, perhaps an immunization specialist as well. And these cases will certainly be reported to the adverse event monitoring that Australia has and or to the TGA. Now let's take a look at why you'd be contraindicated to take the AstraZeneca vaccine, i.e. you cannot possibly have the AstraZeneca vaccine. The first one, is an anaphylaxis after a previous dose. So very similar to the Pfizer vaccine where you've had the vaccination and your face is swollen up, your tongue is swollen up, you can no longer breathing, you find it very difficult to breathe, you're having to go to hospital for acute medical treatment. That is a reason why you may not have a further dose of the AstraZeneca vaccination. Second point is an anaphylaxis to any component of the vaccine, including polysorbate 80. Now this is a chemical compound which is chemically related to PEG. And it says over here, the rate of anaphylaxis to polysorbate 80 is rare. Polysorbate 80 is also included in many other vaccinations. So this means that in some point in your life, you may have already had it in another form of a vaccination. The next reason not to have the AstraZeneca vaccine is a condition known as capillary leak syndrome. This is a condition whereby fluid and proteins will leave your capillaries or your small blood vessels in your body. The net impact of this is initially you feel quite tired, you may get quite swollen, puffy, you may end up then with kidney failure and even stroke. Now it's important to know that this condition is also quite rare and it affects about one in a million people. The next reason not to have the AstraZeneca vaccine is thrombosis with thrombocytopenia. Now we spoke about this before. This is a condition whereby you've had the vaccination, you develop a blood clot on the background of having a low platelet count. Now, generally speaking, this will be a condition that is diagnosed in hospital um, or your general practitioner may perform a blood test just to follow you up after you've had your blood clot. The next point is any other serious adverse event attributed to a previous dose of AstraZeneca and without another cause identified that has been reported to state adverse event reporting programs and or the TJ, so very similar to Pfizer, and has been determined following review by and or on the opinion of an experienced immunization provider slash medical specialist to be contraindicated, taking into account whether repeat vaccines would be associated with a risk of recurrence of serious adverse events. So very similar criteria to the Pfizer vaccination. So now that we understand the criteria, let's talk about the anaphylactic rate of having these vaccinations. So first up, it does also say in this document that for the Pfizer vaccination, there have been an observed rate of anaphylaxis of 4.7 cases per million doses administered in the United States in early 2021. With regards to Moderna in the same period, there were 2.5 cases per million in the same period of time. 89% of cases after the administration of both mRNA vaccines occurred within 30 minutes of vaccination. And that is why it's so important that after you've had your vaccination, you do sit and you observe the period of time that you have to are following your vaccination so that the medical professional can make sure that there aren't any serious adverse events in a short period of time after administration. With regards to AstraZeneca, anaphylaxis to AstraZeneca is rare. The rate of reported anaphylaxis after Astra and AstraZeneca in Australia is less than 10 per million doses, and it is similar to the overall rate of anaphylaxis for other vaccines. 
So there you have it guys, we've just gone through the official documentation as to why somebody may have a temporary exemption or why they may not be able to take one particular vaccine over another as per the Australian Government Department of Health. I hope you guys have found that video useful and it's helped to clear up any myths, any false information that might be out there. And of course, if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to drop me a line in the comment section below. But for now, take care and stay healthy.